2023. Boy, that sure was... something. I can't say it was a bad year, but if I'm being honest, looking back on it, I don't have any strong feelings. I had my highs, I had my lows. On the YouTube front, kind of a mixed bag. After my first Yu-Gi-Oh! video was a runaway hit last year, I dipped my toes back into those waters and found some pretty decent success. Not to the same extent, but uh, pretty good stuff. But at the same time, my other videos, while more successful than in the years prior, just aren't quite hitting it. But my subscriber count has climbed from I don't even remember where to well over 800 people at this point. Thank you guys so much for that. I hope I can cross over to 1,000 subscribers this year, and I hope even more that I keep making great videos for you guys. All right, enough of this gooey sh show of emotion. All right, everyone, let's dig in! This is to my top 11 movies of 2023. Why top 11? Because James Summerton isn't the only blatant plagiarist on YouTube. Also, before we get any further, I'm going to issue a trigger warning for entries 11 and 9. These two terrific films sadly deal with characters either trying and failing or succeeding in the act of ending their own lives. If this is an issue you are sensitive to, I will put up a time code on the screen so that you can skip past these two films. Alright then, let's get to work. Number 11, A Man Called Otto. 2023 started on a good note with a tender little old comedy drama starring Tom Hanks as an old man who's decided he's content with what he's seen and he doesn't need to see any more. And frankly, after the death of his wife, well, he just doesn't want to be here anymore. But then he's cajoled into coming back into the world by the presence of Marina Trevino's Marisol, a married younger woman originally from south of the border with a family of her own who's simply full of life and full of joy who insists on striking up a friendship with Tom's Otto Anderson. And that's about it. It's just Tom reluctantly coming to enjoy this woman's presence in his life and deciding he wants to live and see her and her family have a nice life together. It's really sweet. And on a much less sweet note, there's something very darkly comedic about this very kind Latina unknowingly interrupting Otto's repeated attempts on his own life before he finally decides, screw it, I guess I'm just going to keep living. And hey, it's like I said, it's a dramatic comedy starring the great Tom Hanks. What else do you need? Number 10, Creed 3. Michael B. Jordan makes his directorial debut, and it's a pretty dang good one. I wouldn't say this is my favorite installment in the Creed series, but it's undoubtedly the flashiest and most stylistic, with probably the most sympathetic antagonist of the bunch. Which sucks because the antagonist is played by Jonathan Majors. What a sad waste of talent that one turned out to be. But putting aside, David Anderson is a marvel of a bad guy. The guy somehow managed to guilt his former best friend into a title match straight out of parole, and then he freaking won because he put a hit out on the champion in advance. That's the work of an evil genius. And then you turn around and have Michael as Donnie Creed decide, okay, this won't stand. I need to teach this old buddy of mine a lesson for humiliating my fighter because Donnie is actually retired at the start of this movie. And all this drama makes him decide he needs to fix that because Damien's messed things up far too much. And as far as the final fight goes, well, my personal preference is something much less stylistic. I like my boxing movies that are just guys punching the snot out of each other and with no distractions by doing funny stuff with the environment or with the camera. But credit to Michael for, for doing such creative stuff in his debut. He's been working with all kinds of great filmmakers in the past 10 years. My god, has he taken the lessons to heart. Great work, Michael. Looking forward to whatever you do next. Number 9. The Iron Claw. You know, I knew this was going to be a sad story going into the movie, but I was still blown away at how heartbreaking it all was. The Iron Claw follows the Von Erich family, a family of professional wrestlers from the Texas-based territory, world-class championship wrestling. Fritz von Erich, the patriarch of the family, wrestled as a heel for the NWA for most of his career and was promised that big push with the world title, but it just never came his way. So he pushed his sons to claim the dream he always sought but could never achieve. There was a lofty expectation placed in the von Erich brothers and the majority of them, when they couldn't reach that expectation, they crumbled underneath the weight and self-destructed. David von Erich died from a ruptured intestine, likely brought about by drug use. Mike Von Erich died from a very intentional drug overdose on sleeping medication mixed with alcohol. Carrie Von Erich died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the heart. Chris Von Erich, who was adapted out of the film, died from a self-inflicted gunshot blast to the head. But thankfully, Kevin Von Erich is still with us, and he's played by Zac Efron, who does a terrific job of the film as the oldest of these brothers, and as the guy trying his hardest to bury his father's weight 
while also trying his best to reach out to his brothers, being ultimately incapable of saving them from their own horrific fates. It's a great tragedy of the film. Characters doomed their fates through no fault of their own, all because they just tried to make their dad proud, and they tried as best they could. Number 8. Killers of the Flower Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon is a movie that deals with the genocide and exploitation of the Native Americans living in the American state of Oklahoma. If any of the people who are watching this video happen to be Native American and would rather not hear more about this horrific tragedy, I completely understand and I'll put a time code up for you to skip straight to uh, number seven. While I highly encourage everyone watching this video to seek out this film, especially since you can stream it now on Apple TV+, I can understand if the people affected by the events portrayed in this film would rather not hear more about it. But discussing the actual film though, it's great. It is a terrific film. First off, my god is Robert De Niro a vile human being in this film. This guy is the biggest snake in the grass I've seen in a movie in quite some time. He goes on and on and on to the public about how he cares so much for the Osage community. Now he wants to use his wealth and resources to protect them and then he turns around and he uses that wealth and those resources and his influence to murder and steal from these people. It's disgusting. And speaking of disgusting things, you also have Leonardo DiCaprio as our main character, Ernest Burkhardt, who might be the most pathetic human being I've ever seen in a Scorsese film. The guy loves his wife. He really does. But he just loves money a little bit more. So he freaking poisons her for years on end just so we can bleed her dry financially. And then there's the wife herself, played by the queen herself, Lily Gladstone. You talk about breakout roles, this woman is immaculate. Not only is she terrific in the later scenes where she plays Molly Kyle's horrific suffering and the feeling of portrayal in the latter half of the film, but she's also pitch perfect in the early scenes where she finds herself being charmed by Leo as Ernest, almost despite herself. I'd really love to see this woman do something like a romantic comedy, because the chemistry between her and Leo is actually pretty sweet, at least in the early part of the film, before all the awful stuff happens. The relationship is anything but sweet. What if these two actors were playing characters in a different movie? They could be a pretty good couple. But the movie they are in, my god is it sobering. The brutal and horrific treatment of the Osage in this film is relentless. It's a terrific film, but my god is it bleak. Again, it's on Apple TV Plus if you're curious, go check it out. It's another feather in the great Aunt Martin Scorsese's cap. Number seven, dumb money. Do you remember three years ago when a bunch of people were investing in freaking GameStop of all companies and how a bunch of people made bank on it and then Wall Street and the guys behind these amateur investment apps all started freaking out because they were betting on GameStop's stocks to continue falling? Well, Craig Gillespie, the director of Itania, saw all that too and decided that could be a pretty good movie. And what was the end result? Well, the end result is that he was right. It was a pretty good movie. This movie feels like it's the opposite end of Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street, where Wolf is about a bunch of richer-than-you jerks screwing over the little guy. Dumb Money is about the little guy screwing over the richer-than-you jerks. And all that sounds entertaining by itself, the film was also anchored by the Riddler himself, Paul Dano, as our lead character, Mr. Keith Gill, a lower-middle-class family man who works as a financial analyst in Boston, and who winds up inadvertently masterminding this whole operation purely because, in his words, I just like the stock. And that's the truly brilliant aspect of this whole thing. Keith isn't an evil genius who intentionally tried to screw over his boss's boss's boss. He was a hobbyist who just thought a random thing had some potential, and he turned out to be right. Isn't that nuts? Number six, Joyride. I did not expect to be made so emotional because of a raunchy comedy about four Chinese American women, but holy shnikes did this movie make me cry. To sum it up, Ashley Park plays Audrey Sullivan, a Chinese American woman adopted by white parents as baby, who visits her birth country with her best friend, her college roommate, and her bestie's cousin, and while there, Audrey realizes she doesn't know the first dang thing about being Chinese. And to top it all off, she finds out that You're not Chinese. She isn't Chinese at all. Her birth parents were from South Korea. So because Audrey and her roomie are pretty well off financially, they arrange for a trip from Beijing to Seoul, where Audrey meets with a man named Dae Han, her late biological mother's husband, who was not her biological father. Dae explains that Audrey's mom passed away a few years ago, but that Audrey was never far from her mind. It even shows her a few video messages she'd made for Audrey for if she'd ever managed to get back in touch with her. And on top of that genuinely touching sequence, the movie asks some pretty poignant questions about Audrey's identity. She grew up with white parents, so she's more openly affectionate 
with her family than her Asian friends are with theirs, but she still experiences the same anti-Asian racism and a lot of the model minority stereotyping that a lot of Asian Americans and Asians in America in general experience. And that's on top of just the whole other identity crisis that comes from believing you're Chinese your whole life, but then finding out, holy crap, I'm freaking Korean. And that's all on top of just being a pretty good Rashi comedy in general. Check it out if you haven't already, it's a pretty good time. Number five, John Wick Chapter Four. It's bleeping John Wick Chapter Four! What on earth could you possibly want me to say? The action is sick. Keanu Reeves is really cool. Donnie Yen is really cool. Ian McShane is really cool. Hiroyuki Sonata was really cool. Scott Atkins was really fun as this heavy set guy who you don't assume at first could throw hands, but my god, can he ever. Rina Sawayama, my god, this girl is a star in the making. I hope she gets a spin off film. Bill Skarsgård plays such a great slimy little jerk. The ending with John blowing his freaking head off is so freaking satisfying. I heard chatter from Chad Stahelski that. The movie is actually a combined cut of what was supposed to be John Wick's 4 and 5, and I'd really love to see the extended cut he's talked about, because my god, does that sound awesome. Because this was already cool, so even more of this sounds even more cool. Please, please make this happen, Hollywood. Please, I will give you my money. Please, I promise I will give you my money. Number 4, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. You know what? I think James Gunn and the MCU really were a match made in heaven. This series and these characters somehow managed to help this edgy boy find his heart. Rocket's arc of self-love and self-acceptance comes to a grand close with this film, with him reconnecting with his origin and finally accepting himself for who he is. He's Rocket Raccoon, and he's not just a guardian of the galaxy, he's the freaking leader of the club. And I can't wait to see what he does next. The end credits say Star-Lord will return, but quite frankly, I'd be more than happy to let Chris Pratt retire from this franchise and just focus on Rocket and this new Guardians team going forward. I think Star-Lord's story was finished after Guardians 2, but Rocket's story is just getting started. And that final sequence set to The Dog Days Are Over by Florence and the Machine really does just kill me. Between this and the Cat Stevens end sequence from Guardians 2, Gun might have an argument for being to ending montages what Zack Snyder is to opening montages. I don't have a great deal of confidence in Gunn's take on the DC Universe, not because of the man himself, but because of the climate at Warner and the general tone of the film press surrounding any film by DC Comics. But if nothing else, the man left the competition on a high note. Well done, sir. So normally when I do these videos, I take a few minutes to talk about movies that I didn't like this year. But honestly, while there were at least three movies I could talk about, eh, I don't feel like it, honestly. It's not even out of some philosophy of wanting to be positive, I just don't think those movies are worth talking about. They weren't very good, but I don't think there's anything interesting about the films themselves as a piece of entertainment that warrants me picking them apart. So, with that all being said, let's move on to my top three picks. Number three, Spider-Man Across... The Spider-Verse. So here's my hot take. Into the Spider-Verse? Kind of overrated. Don't get me wrong, it's firing on all cylinders. The animation, the characterization and character arcs, the score and the soundtrack, it's all boom, boom, boom. But as far as the baddies go, they're far from terrible. But even after Fisk literally murders Earth 1610's Peter Parker, I never felt worried about how Miles and the gang were gonna beat this guy. But the spot in Miguel? Oh, I was on the edge of my seat. A couple weeks back, I saw a tweet calling this movie and Avengers Infinity War Gen Z and Jane Alpha's Empire Strikes Back, and I think they might be onto something. The entire sequence of Miles, Pavitar, Hobie, and Gwen trying and failing to convince Dr. Jonathan to turn away from the Super Collider from Pavatar's universe, and then seeing more powerful than ever version of the spot emerge from it, then turn to Miles specifically and gleefully tell him See you back home, Spider-Man. It's probably the most terrifying sequence I saw all year. And sweet lord, Miguel is probably one of the best takes on a comic book movie character who is an antagonist, but not necessarily a villain. He's aloof and somewhat callous, but he's not genuinely cruel to Miles until he finally forces him to the end of his patience. He genuinely tried to be nice, but this kid can't seem to grasp that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And Miles rebels against Miguel because Miles says, screw this crap, I'm gonna save my dad and the multiverse and you're not gonna stop me. 
And the supporting cast in this one, where Penny, Spider-Ham, and Noir were all a lot of fun in Into the Spider-Verse, Hobie, Pavater are a million times more interesting and better developed. I truly cannot wait for Beyond the Spider-Verse. I just hope that Lord and Miller don't overwork their or staff again. Workers rights for animators. 3D animators, 2D animators, claymation, whatever it is. Rights for them all. They put in the work. They deserve to see the success. And they don't deserve to be treated like animals. Number two, The Holdovers. The Holdovers follows Paul Giamatti as Professor Paul Hunnam, a standoffish, rude, and above all, strict classics teacher who teaches at a prep school in New England. He needs to stay at the school over winter break because a handful of kids can't find any place to stay during the holidays, including Dominic Sessa's Angus Tully, a bratty, brilliant, but lazy type of kid who's kind of going through it right now. His mom recently remarried after his father had a mental breakdown and she decided to leave him at school while she and her new man had their honeymoon. Paul at first doesn't think much of Angus and the feeling is mutual, but as their story progresses, the two eventually come to see where the other one is coming from and really grow to respect and care for one another. It's a really simple but really great story anchored by stellar performances from the veteran Giamatti and the newcomer Sessa. I keep my eyes on that kid because if he's got a good agent, he's going to be doing big things in the future. I absolutely adored this film when I saw it, and I still do now, but there's unfortunately one small thing that I need to address. You see, immediately after seeing this film, I found out that this director, Alexander Payne, was accused of something pretty heinous by actress Rose McGowan. I looked up the matter for this video and found that Payne has publicly disputed McGowan's claims, so at this point it's he said, she said. Well, I don't believe McGowan has any reason to publicly lie, I don't want to condemn someone for something that they may not have done. That said, while I love the man's work between this and Nebraska, I've never seen Sideways. I also don't feel comfortable supporting him anymore after this, in light of these allegations. So while I love this film, and I do recommend it, I would encourage you to pirate it instead of watching it on streaming, but continuing to support the actors in this cast and any of their future endeavors, especially Dominic Sessa, who again, I'm almost certain is going to be a big deal in the future. Number one, Oppenheimer. I remember all the way back in fourth grade. My school handed us out all a little booklet with names and facts about 100 influential people. And one of the names that I was immediately intrigued by was J. Robert Oppenheimer. I never did a great deal of research on the man, but I definitely found him interesting. The idea of a man who created history's ultimate weapon and then slowly realized, oh my god, I, I think I've just destroyed the world, was so fascinating to me. And when the news came out that Chris Nolan, probably one of my top two filmmakers along Zack Snyder, was gonna make this movie, I was immediately excited. And the final product did not disappoint. The film perfectly exemplifies the phrase, no points for neutrality. Oppenheimer continually refuses to take a stand on anything except for just wanting to do scientific research. And in the end, it bites him on the butt because not only is he responsible for creating a weapon that killed over 350,000 people, but he's also targeted by the Red Scare of the 50s. He never took a stand on anything, and now he has to deal with the horrific consequences of that. The Cold War. And that final exchange between Oppie and Einstein is genuinely the most haunting thing I saw in a movie theater in 2023. So much credit to Killian Murphy and the rest of, the, of this dynamite cast. You all killed it. And of course, credit as always to my man Christopher Nolan. Well done, sir. 2023, in my opinion, was an exceptionally meh year, unfortunately. It had ups and it had downs, but on a scale of 1 to 10, a lot of it just kind of existed in a 4 to 6 range. Either not good, but not worth being mad at, or not bad, but not worth celebrating. But man, oh man, was the stuff worth celebrating really, really worth celebrating. There's a lot of movies I could have mentioned in this list if I wanted to make it bigger. Movies like Cocaine Bear, A Haunting in Venice... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, You People, Elemental, and Air. These all could have made the list if I wanted to make the list bigger. Uh, hopefully, 2024 will be better than 2023. But then again, it's an election year here in the United States, so that's very unlikely. But we can always hope for the best. Thank you all for joining me this year. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you'll continue to follow me throughout the rest of the year. I'm very sorry this video came out so darn late. I wanted to get it out sooner, but the time got away from me. I've got a playlist up of my other year-end lists, so feel free to check those out. If you're here right now, you've probably seen my 
one really long video about Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters, so feel free to check out my other Yu-Gi-Oh! videos. I did a video about Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Season 1 and the three Yu-Gi-Oh! movies. I've also done plenty of reviews about plenty of comic book movies and other franchises, so go check that out if you're interested. The videos that will likely be the most relevant in the coming days will likely be my pro wrestling videos, because I'm doing two very late Black History Month specials about WWE. This was going to be one video about the individual reigns of every single black wrestler to have been the WWE champion, but the time got away from me, so instead I'll be doing two retrospectives, one on Kofi Mania and one on The Rock's two-year run as a part-timer in WWE. We're going to be talking about his run from just before WrestleMania 27 all the way out to WrestleMania 29. So stay tuned for that and enjoy the rest of your year. Have a great day, everyone. Woodstock out. Mm -hmm.